Hi, welcome everybody. Good morning to those in Central America, United States, Canada, and good afternoon to everybody um, in Southern Africa. I know there is a lot of people from Southern Africa joining us today. Um, thank you, Brennison, for your introduction and to Women's Advocates for having me. And thank you to um, the ASL interpreters. Um, we appreciate you being here. So welcome to uh, Sexual Violence and International Perspective, because personal thoughts from a decently traveled activist with mainly Southern African perspective, who has dedicated a year of her life to learning USA best practices and hopes to use a fusion of those two things to make an impact in her home country was way too long and not as catchy. Um, Brennison, your title is much better. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Nature Inger. I'm a human rights advocate from Botswana, and I'm currently in Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota, specifically the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. And I have the great honor of being part of the Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship Program. I'm in the Law and Human Rights Department there. And I'm here to expand my knowledge on sexual violence and gender-based violence, which is the specific field um, that my advocacy is in. Um, disclaimer, before I begin, I always like to start with this disclaimer. Um, I think we all know that there is a lot of gendered language typically in the space of gender-based violence um, and sexual violence. And it's very difficult to speak about facts and statistics without referencing gender. Um, but having said that, I just want to make it clear and remind everybody that anybody of any gender or gender non-conforming can be both a perpetrator of abuse and a victim or a survivor of abuse. So I just want us to keep that in mind, even though I will be speaking a lot about men and women, um, I want us to remember that. And to also remember that things like gender identity, sexuality, race, um, typically amplify the violence that people face and experience. So I won't be going too much into that today, but I just want us to respectfully keep it in mind moving forward. Um, let's jump into it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, please feel free, by the way, as Brennison already said, to engage, to ask questions. Um, I will try to keep my eye on the chat um, and I hope Brennison will help me as well if I perhaps miss any questions. Um, but I know that there's lots of people logging in. I've loved seeing your introductions here and I know that we will all have different levels of knowledge on sexual violence. So I just want to say that this is a kind of general one-on-one -on -one session um, where I'm covering the basics on the specific objectives that I have. And it assumes that you have um, at least a basic understanding of sexual violence. Um, and I will try to address these topics with care and kindness because they are sensitive topics and they're difficult to deal with a lot of times. So as Brennison said, please take care of your well-being and do what you need to do to, to protect your peace. So um, my objectives for this webinar today are to explore why men rape and assault people at a higher rate than women do, to examine how we socialize genders in ways that negatively impact how we view sexual relations and sex in general, to identify how to engage all genders in sexual assault awareness and education, to understand gendered impact during natural disasters and pandemics nationally and internationally, and also to recognize how Botswana became a global leader for countries combating HIV AIDS and how we can apply some of those same tools or at least modernized versions of them to help combat sexual violence. Next slide, please. Statistics. Um, so let's have a look at some statistics. As I mentioned, today I won't be getting into um, gender and sexual minorities or people with disabilities, but in most instances, it is worse in those cases. Um, I also want to mention that statistics and the exact number change from country to country, year by year, um, even when they are low 
uh, labeled global statistics, they do change, um, but you know, they're obviously very important to the work that we do, they're vital, um, but I don't want people to get overly caught up in them or worried when they change or they see them looking different on different platforms, um, that is normal. And they are things like this that affect statistics and the way that they're measured. Um, and again, going back to the way that we're socialized, as an example, uh, we know that males are less likely to report sexual violence, um, which is already an extremely underreported uh, crime. In fact, it's the most underreported crime in the world, with about 60% of those crimes not being reported to the police. So statistics. Um, are here to help us, but may not be an exact science in accuracy. Um, so the statistics, one in five women have experienced rape uh, or attempted rape. One in two women have experienced other forms of sexual violence. One in 71 men have experienced rape. Let's bear that underreporting in mind. And one in five men have experienced other forms of sexual violence. Next slide, thank you. Um, one in six female victims reported being raped by two different perpetrators, and one in eight female rape victims reported three or more different perpetrators. Uh, women who experience sexual assault as children are more likely to be sexually assaulted as adults. Um, men account for 98% of rapes against both male and female victims. That is an alarming statistic. And men also commit two times more sexually coercive acts than women. So the question here really is why? Uh, we can see that there's an obvious uh, disparity, but why is there? Again, a reminder, anybody of any gender uh, or gender non-conforming can be a victim, a survivor, or a perpetrator of sexual abuse. But it's difficult to ignore that these crimes have such an alarmingly uh, different or such an alarming disparity between these genders. So I think that gender is such a major issue in the space of sexual violence, uh, not because of any traits that we may be inherently tied to um, due to the genitals that we're born with or even the genders that we choose to identify with but because of the way that we are socialized depending on our different countries cultures societies in general and the belief systems that attach themselves to that kind of socialization um, socialization affects many aspects of our lives and they're tons and tons of studies and research that show um, how much we are affected by this in our everyday life. There's one specific US-based study that uh, did a study on children age five to six that showed that at around five years old, children typically do not notice any gender differences, do not think themselves any less or any better than people of the opposite gender. However, as early as six years old, uh, both girls and boys were more likely to believe that boys were more intelligent, um, which is fascinating to me. One, one year can make all the difference. Um, this belief obviously goes on to discourage young girls to not pursue careers or even hobbies that are considered uh, more difficult, that would require more intelligence in order to be successful as. And so we see children uh, dropping off from hobbies and careers, for example, STEM at a young age and creating spaces that make these uh, areas more male dominated. And if this is happening at just age six, then you can just imagine how these sort of gender roles and socializations affect us the older that we get. That was just one example, a general one, but I really want to focus today on how this kind of socializing and these belief systems um, affect us um, when it comes specifically to sex and the sexual relations or even the ways that we enjoy sex. We teach boys and girls or men and women, very, very different ideologies about sex, whether we realize it or not. Some of these lessons are in very subtle ways. For example, the way that uh, women are sexualized in the media. 
and girls are often taught that pretty is the rent that they have to pay to occupy the world. Uh, that was said by Erin McKean. I'm borrowing her words. Um, but this can create subconscious feelings of wanting male validation based on appearance, which is just one way that people are socialized. Another example of subtleties in the way that we are taught about sex is the way that sex education is taught in schools, if it's taught at all. And typically, genders are separated into different uh, classrooms or different spaces. And women are taught that, well, now you'll have a period, you will bleed, you are now capable of getting pregnant, so avoid sex at all costs. And men, on the other hand, or boys at that time, are taught that you will grow body hair, you will ejaculate, and you'll be able to have erections. Uh, whether or not we are saying it literally, these lessons are teaching girls and boys very, very different things about sex. And that is, of course, a very general overview of sex education, although in my experience, um, that is typically the level of sex education that is being taught. Um, another thing that is commonly preached around the world and in my home country uh, specifically, maybe not necessarily in schools or in an academic system or way, but culturally is purity culture. And it is not that I believe that purity culture is inherently bad or that waiting for marriage before you have sex is wrong. My personal issue with this is that it's taught in a way that is not gender inclusive, that is not equal between genders. And so it creates these underlying messages and facts that often lead to much worse consequences than young people having safe consensual sex. Um, it's so often pushed onto girls and the same is just not true for boys. And in many cultures, even modern and liberal cultures, uh, for example, we often view the Western world and Western culture as being more advanced and more progressive. But these subtleties are still taught in a lot of um, cultures, both in the developing world and the modern world. And women are taught that sex makes them impure, that the more partners they sleep with, the more of a, insert whatever derogatory term is trending at the time they are. Um, and boys are taught pretty much the opposite of that. And the issue here is that, I mean, there's so many issues with it really. For example, so many boys and men have said that they did not realize that they had been raped, that they did not know that they had been sexually assaulted because they thought that they were supposed to want it. They thought that they were supposed to enjoy it and therefore they didn't feel as if they had the right to feel coerced. So first of all, we are endangering uh, boys and men by spreading this belief system. But on top of that, uh, any thing that we try to, to teach that is supposed to be of high moral standing or a representation of ethics, if we only put pressure on one gender to fulfill that rule, it's simply creating yet another scenario where the true outcome becomes controlling women's bodies. And that, of course, is an issue. Uh, to kind of summarize this point, we are socializing women and girls to not want sex and to avoid it. But then young boys and men are being socialized to not just desire sex, but to seek it out. And I don't think I need to point out what the problem is with that. Um, there also seems to be an underlying belief that if we don't let girls know that sex is enjoyable, if we just keep it a secret and um, don't let the girls find out that sex is good, that girls and women will avoid having it. But research has shown that, in fact, this is not at all true. Um, 
if we socialize genders to believe that sex is something that only men want, that sex is something that you do for a man, or even worse, sex is something that a man does to you, then girls are likely to have sex for all the wrong reasons. For example, to, and this is just one of many examples, but for example, to win the admiration or validation of their male counterparts, which as we discussed, many young girls are being socialized to do and, and to seek and to want. Um, and research has shown that when girls actually focus on their own pleasure, uh, when they have a high level of self-understanding, a high level understanding of sex and of themselves physically, mentally, and emotionally, that they're actually more likely to hold sex at a much higher standard, and therefore they're more likely to wait before having sex. Um, Peggy Orenstein, next slide please. Peggy Orenstein is an author, an award-winning journalist and presenter whose work I really enjoy and she presents on gender issues and she has extremely interesting views on gender disparity and the mixed messages that we send out to gender both in the way that we're socialized and in the media and in a presentation that she gave called let's talk about sex um, how a new generation navigates hookups porn love and consent her studies revealed this that most girls think oral sex is no big deal only when boys are on the receiving end. And girls that I did interviews with stated that they would do it sometimes to avoid the intimacy of actual sex, to be considered more attractive, to improve a relationship, or to make themselves feel more desired. However, girls didn't want it in return. She also said, women are more likely to measure their satisfaction based on their partner's satisfaction whereas men are more likely to measure their satisfaction by their own orgasm. Women prioritizing their partner's pleasure holds true regardless of their partner's gender. So in same-sex relationship, the orgasm gap disappears and women climax at the same rate as men. I find that fascinating and I wish we had time to unpack her entire presentation and research because I, I personally find it so interesting. But if I had to focus on just one point, it would be for us to reflect on and think about how different the world would look if we socialized people, taught people to measure their own satisfaction by their partner's satisfaction, whether that's a romantic partner or just a sexual partner, um, and not just by their own desires. That would change the way that we view sex um, and, I think it would just have such an, an interesting impact. I'm just going to see, uh, read this question. Do you think that there is a correlation between domestic violence and sexual violence? I definitely believe that there is a correlation between domestic violence and sexual violence. Dare I say all violence. Um, the main pillar or one of the major pillars of abuse is truly power. And that's another thing that a lot of research will show that acts of sexual violence and rape have very little to do with the act of sex itself or the need or desire to have sex and have a lot to do with power. So any situation where somebody is abusing their power over somebody else um, creates that correlation. And I think that power is the, the linkage between all of them. Thank you, Wendy, for, for that question. And um, another question, is there any way we can get the resources for the statistics information in this webinar? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you will get this exact PDF sent to you, as Brennison said, and I'm also happy to share um, all of the information I have created a landing page, which I will give that information to Brennison and hopefully she'll be able to send that out to all of you so that you can uh, look at all of my resources in your own time. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, another popular belief that we have or that we're socialized to believe is that sexual violence and um, domestic violence are women's issues. And I suppose, the logic behind this is that because it happens mostly to women that um, it should be solved by women but this this belief is 
one of my biggest pet peeves, and that was the politest way I could think to express how much it irks me. <laughs> but I think it's time for us to admit that we need tools and methods that go beyond just women's empowerment. And to clarify, I am a huge advocate for women empowerment in any shape, uh, way or form. However, it just cannot be relied on as the only measure or tool to end sexual violence. Um, it, it can never be the responsibility of existing or potential survivors to put an end to sexual violence. It simply does not work and the logic behind it makes no sense. Um, Dr. Jackson Katz is the founder of Mentors and Violence Prevention, and he's founded uh, a lot of, of, of different presentations and ideas. He's an advocate for bystander intervention, which is one form or one way that individuals and schools, corporations, people can play a, a role in ending sexual violence. And he gave a TED talk, which is called Violence Against Women. It's a men's issue. And in that TED talk, he says, if we can get to the place where men who act out in sexist ways will lose status and um, young men and boys, who, oh, who act out in sexist and harassing ways towards girls and women, as well as towards other boys and men will lose status as a result of it, guess what? We'll see a radical diminution of the abuse. And to, to touch on how true that is, I think that as humanity, we forget how much of a community we are. Um, in Africa, before colonization, many different tribes as a punishment for serious crimes, for murder, for rape, people would not be jailed or trapped or killed. People would actually be removed from their societies, removed from their tribes, and they would be forced to leave the tribe and completely isolated. And that was considered the worst form of punishment, more than being jailed, more than having your life taken away from you. And um, I'm not suggesting that we somehow just remove people magically from our communities, our countries, and our societies. But what I am saying is that I think that it is very normal for people to want to be part of their societies, for people to want to be part of their communities. We all crave a human interaction in some way, shape or form. And to be completely shunned by your community is extremely, extremely impactful. I don't believe in shunning people uh, in terms of teaching and education. I believe that we should carry this out with kindness and with understanding and meet people where they are. However, I do agree with Dr. Katz that if we changed what is acceptable in society, what things men and people can joke about and say, it would have a positive impact on how we view these things in general. He goes on to say, there's been an awful lot of silence in male culture about this ongoing tragedy of men's violence against women and children. All I'm saying is we need to break the silence and we need more men to do that. But it's easier said than done because it's not easy in male culture for guys to challenge each other, which is one of the reasons why part of the paradigm shift that has to happen is not just understanding these issues as men's issues, but also as leadership issues for men. And I just love that. Uh, I love the idea of leadership, of using uh, privilege and, and power as a means to have positive effect and change on people as a means to be a positive role, map, role model and to inspire people to, to do good as opposed to simply enjoying what comes with the privileges and uh, not accepting any of the responsibilities that come with it. Um, again, that, that TED talk will be on the landing page that I will share. If anybody wants to go and watch it, I highly recommend it. Um, next slide, please. So gendered impact during global disasters and pandemics. When I came to the United States to pursue this fellowship program, one of the main things I wanted to focus my studies on was this gendered impact during natural disasters and pandemics. Um, this was not only because I had seen such a drastic rise in sexual violence and domestic abuse in my home country, which already has some of the worst rates of sexual violence in the world, 
uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic is when I saw this rise. But it was also because to be frank, I was scared and I still am scared of how yet another pandemic will affect my home country and my people. But more on that in just a little bit. Um, next slide, please. Um, so why consider gender when responding to epidemics and pandemics? Um, this is a very good question because obviously pandemics and epidemics affect everybody. And before I move forward, I want to make it clear that everybody is affected. And in fact, there are some statistics that are so sad in most epidemics and pandemics, men die at a higher rate than women. This is because, for example, in cases of war and conflict, men are the ones typically taking up arms and, and fighting. So this is in no way to suggest that men are not um, drastically affected by epidemics and, and pandemics. They truly, truly are. And I, I just want to acknowledge that before moving forward. Um, but women, how women fare compared to men is largely due to long existing inequalities, which are heightened by pandemics. So basically all crises amplify already existing gender inequalities. And as United Nations women states, uh, climate change is a threat multiplier. So this means that it escalates social political and economic tensions in general, but especially in fragile and conflict afflicted settings. So certain areas will feel the effects of this more than more than others. Um, next slide. Let's look at some of these facts. So in terms of economic inequality, women spend three times as many hours as men in unpaid care and domestic work, limiting their access to decent work. The global gender gap um, pay gap is stuck at 16 percent, with women paid up to 35 percent less than men in some countries. 740 million women globally work in the informal economy. And women aged 25 to 34 globally are 25% more likely than men to live in extreme poverty. Um, paid and unpaid care work. Globally, women form 70% of the healthcare and social services workforce. So this means that oftentimes women are on the front lines, especially when it came to things like the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there is more women than men on the front lines exposing themselves to uh, the virus. Women spend 4.1 hours per day on unpaid care and domestic work compared to just 1.7 hours per day when it comes to men. Women's unpaid contributions to healthcare equate to 2.35% of global GDP or the equivalent in US dollars of 1.5 trillion. Everybody in Southern Africa right now I know is doing the math in their heads and like, it's a lot. Um, when, women contribute, when women's contributions to all types of care, not just healthcare, is considered, this figure rises to 11 trillion US dollars. I mean, it's an insane amount. Um, there is higher risk of domestic and sexual abuse, as we've seen uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic now globally. It has increased the the percentage of domestic and sexual abuse is happening globally. In 2020, 243 million women and girls aged 15 to 49 were subjected to sexual and or physical violence perpetrated by an intimate partner. And that number has only increased since. To note, uh, while lockdowns are happening and all of these measures are taking place to keep us safe, a lot of people are trapped at home with their perpetrators and with their abusers. And that's made this pandemic so, so difficult because there's a shadow pandemic happening right under it, which makes it truly difficult. Next slide, please. And then, uh, Botswana's HIV-AIDS pandemic. Um, 
I know there's a lot of people from Botswana who are joining us for this webinar today. Um, so I know a lot of people watching are already honorary experts on HIV and AIDS because of how we were socialized uh, to prioritize education and action on HIV AIDS in our home country. Um, so I know this topic can be a bit boring, but please bear with me because we're right at the end. And if you're someone who's watching who does not have a lot of knowledge on HIV AIDS or specifically how it affected not just Botswana, but Africa as a whole, um, I would like to recommend a, a book called Saturday is for Funerals by Unity Dow and Max Essex. It's a compilation of, of stories uh, of Botswana during the time of the pandemic. And it's a really wonderful compilation of great storytelling and also very relevant scientific explanations. Um, I will make sure to, to write that as well on the landing page for those of you that are seeking these resources after the webinar. Um, but even if you have no interest in reading the book, I'm here to give you the one on one. So let's begin. Um, So in 1985, the first case of HIV was reported in Botswana. Um, Botswana's first national HIV program was established. So you can see it only took a few years for that to happen. And of course, in 1985, when it was first introduced, there was very little knowledge of HIV AIDS, of um, the root causes, how it was contracted, how it was passed on, et cetera. Globally, there was very little knowledge. Um, but as you can see, it only took a few years for the first HIV program to be established. In 1998, Festus Machaya became president and the national campaign to tackle HIV really went full force. Machaya made HIV one of the top priorities of his administration. And he even made a commitment early in his presidency to never give a speech in Botswana that did not mention HIV AIDS. So it was taken very seriously. Uh, Botswana established the National AIDS Coordinating Agency. It was the first country in Africa to implement AZT as part of the prevention of mother to child transmission, the PMTCT program. And in the early days of Machaya's administration, roughly 40% of babies born to HIV positive mothers also ended up infected with the virus. Uh, the PMTCT program was very successful though in lowering these percentages. Botswana also became the first nation in Africa to launch a program to try to provide access to HIV drug treatment nationwide. Um, there, Botswana really, really took a, an incredible global stance on this and, and made it a priority. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. I love this picture of His Excellency Festus Machaya, by the way. Isn't that a great picture? Um, President Festus Machaya addressed the United Nations General Assembly and urged international support to address the epidemic. He also urged support for the National HIV AIDS Strategic Plan in Botswana, which encompassed a multi-sectoral strategy involving both the private and public sectors, as well as significant invest investment from the government itself. Um, I also want to say that he took on a, a non-secular approach to dealing with HIV AIDS, which is very important to note for a nation like Botswana, which uh, is quite conservative and typically takes on a Christian approach to a lot of its cultural and societal teachings. And this was, I believe, a, a very progressive move in general, but especially during this time. Botswana established the MASA program, the flagship national HIV treatment program, and the government collaborated with the Merck Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and formed African Comprehensive HIV AIDS Partnership. Support from the US government president's emergency plan for AIDS and relief allowed for the development of HIV training and mentorship programs, voluntary counseling, testing for HIV, support for lab services and supplementation of the government's provision of uh, antiretroviral um, treatments. 
Botswana began routine, non-compulsory opt-out HIV screening in prenatal and other healthcare settings in order to treat as many people as possible. This shift to universal free ART represented a major departure from prior strategies focused on behavior change, especially the use of condoms and other protective sex measures. Everything that I've said is honestly just a fraction of all of the measures that were, were taken and put in place to create this major national campaign that took place over years with the priority of improving the health and not just the health, but the mindset and the beliefs of people surrounding HIV and AIDS. Everybody in Botswana knows their ABCs. Uh, this was taught, the first time I received this lesson, I was eight years old. I'm sure that different schools had different starting ages for teaching this program, but this was the main marketing pitch and teaching foundation for education around um, HIV AIDS and preventative measures to abstain from sex if you could, if you were a minor, if you, um, chose not to have sex, if you did choose to have sex, to be faithful to your partner so that you weren't putting each other at risk. And of course, regardless of all of these things, to use a condom. Uh, the ABCs were so popularly known. They were on billboards around the country. They were plastered on our public transport. Personally, I could not go one day without seeing or hearing somebody or something reference the ABCs. Um, and everything I've mentioned is just a little bit of evidence of how hands-on, innovative, and successful Botswana can be at managing crisis. So my question is, why has the same attention not been given to the crisis that is rape and gender-based violence? And I don't have the answer to that question. Um, I certainly don't want to suggest that it might be being ignored because many of our societies only prioritize crises when they disproportionately or at least equally affect cisgendered men, uh, especially those in leadership positions, um, or that some cisgendered men benefit from rape culture and therefore they have no intention of taking practical measures to put an end to it. And since I don't want to suggest that, it leaves me back at square one with no real answer. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I grew up in, in a country that was deeply affected by the pandemic that was HIV AIDS. And as the daughter of someone who worked closely with people infected and affected by HIV AIDS, who volunteered with the NGO that my father ran, I um, had a front row seat to how a lot of these tools were being used um, and implemented. And there were a lot more than the ones I'm going to mention here today. But uh, in my opinion, that the main ones were establishing the root cause and making that public knowledge, creating a public understanding of what the root cause of the issue was. And then education. This was acad academic education within schools and other um, teaching places within churches, uh, community education, through marketing, through um, teachings in our rural areas, as well as our cities, first responder and service provider education to our police officers, to nurses, to doctors, to everybody who would have to deal with this situation as a first responder. We also had changes in policy and legislation, mainly surrounding stigma, uh, laws that were created to protect people from stigma, to protect the health and well-being of people. There was a lot of policy and legislation changes during that time. And we were also able to challenge cultural norms and shift mindsets, which I would argue is the most difficult part of making changes like this is changing the mindset of people, making people prioritize issues and making people understand the avalanche that cultural and societal beliefs have and how it affects these issues. And this was seen in 
I mean, in so many ways, we shifted as Botswana from being a nation where talking about sex or even private parts was taboo and almost unheard of, quite a conservative nation, uh, to being a nation that gave out condoms for free, that taught sex education in schools, that ran public campaigns about male circumcision and how it could reduce HIV susceptibility, to ending stigma around uh, people living with HIV and AIDS, uh, which was one of the main focuses really of the public education, and so, so, so many more mindset shifts. Um, I've personally witnessed an entire nation successfully shift to address a national crisis in my lifetime. And I believe that we can shift again. I believe that there's something to be learned from the way that Botswana dealt with this crisis, from the tools that were implemented, from the international help and learning that we took on, from mixing and merging both contemporary tools with a lot of our own traditional values. And I believe that the way that this pandemic was handled is not just evidence that it's possible, but um, that the actual tools, of course, revised, modernized, and specified to the specific issue of sexual violence and abuse in general, um, can be used successfully uh, to, to curb the issue and the crisis that is sexual violence. And, I hope to get to see that in my lifetime. I hope to see yet another, not just national shift, but an international shift in how we deal with these issues. Um, last slide in closing, the founder of the Me Too movement, Tarana Burke said, um, we have to dismantle the building blocks of sexual violence, power and privilege, which I touched on earlier. And, I believe that one of the ways of, of doing that is by educating ourselves and others, uh, recognizing our own individual power and privilege, no matter how small or grand we think it is, and using that to be good leaders um, in our communities, in our workspaces, in our learning spaces, even within our own families. So um, I will take time to look at the questions. I know that there's a lot of them, um, but just in closing for anyone that might be leaving before I get to the Q and A's, I would just like to thank you for sharing time and space and energy with me today and for allowing me to share some of what I've learned and also some of my personal beliefs with you. Um, if you have any questions and reflections outside of the webinar and you would like to reach me, I welcome you to email me at natureingermanagement at gmail.com and you, you can also reach out to me on Instagram at I am nature Inger. Thank you, Gale Bocha, and, and please remember to take care of your well-being and, and protect your peace um, if this was a difficult topic for you. I'll just go up and see if there's any questions I might have missed. I see someone has their hand raised. Would you like to unmute? We can uh, allow you to unmute and ask your question, Jackie. And I'll put some links in the chat to the PowerPoint slides, certificates. And some of our Sexual Assault Awareness Month uh, programming was rescheduled for May, so I'll include those links in the chat as well. But Nature, it looks like you do have a question from... What, the, um, what do you think the role of civil society groups um, and empowerment for women within Botswana's government policy? How could they inspire or take an active role in fostering as revolutionary of a response as HIV AIDS was? I'm thinking of the dramatic role such groups had in South Africa. That is an amazing question. I love that question. Um, there is definitely a role within civil society that is so important. Um, I think that one main thing that I would love to see happen in Botswana is the joining of these NGOs and organizations. I think that so many NGOs and organizations, even that I work with, 
are doing such incredible work, but because we are work working towards a common goal, but working towards it in different directions, I think a lot of the impact is missed. And I would love to see um, organizations take a more partnered approach in Botswana. And that's something that I've been able to see here in Minnesota, organizations um, and NGOs that are not related at all, um, taking partnered approaches, having meetups and Zoom sessions where they share their new findings and statistics and really just partnering and understanding that they have the same goal and working towards it um, together. I think that that in itself would be something I would absolutely love to see in Botswana. In terms of Botswana's government, oh, there's a knock at my door. In terms of Botswana's government, um, they could inspire or take action, I think, by simply taking action. I think that I am so tired of, um, I have to remember to be extremely polite when it comes to this, but I am, excuse me. Nature will be back soon. Thank you for sticking with us. You will see in the chat, I put a lot of different resources that Nature mentions, including the TED Talk, on violence against women, it's a men's issue that will also be included in the follow-up email as well. Saturdays for funerals, that's also included in the chat, will also be in the follow-up email. And then new dates for the other two, um, spectrum of sexual violence and sifting to a culture of respect and consent are also in the chat and nature is back with us. Sorry, I'm, I'm back. Um... Yes, yeah, so I think that there isn't enough action being taken because as I said, the government itself seems to be pushing the responsibility of dealing with this issue mainly onto women. There's a lot of empowerment conferences and meetings and projects that are taking place, which are important. I do support that. However, in Botswana specifically, I am not seeing any form of, for example, perpetrator rehabilitation, which has been statistically proven to um, ensure that people don't reoffend or it can't ensure that people don't reoffend. But statistically, the number of people, the percentage of reoffenses goes down when action is taken and people are given that intervention. Um, we're not seeing anything like that. We are not seeing consent being taught in schools or consent being taught at all. And consent is a bare minimum that should be made a priority in education, academic and culturally. We are not seeing really any action that is directed or inclusive towards men. And we are not seeing enough support of our LGBTQ communities and responses to the abuse and the domestic violence that they are facing. So there is truly a lot of action that can be taken. But the fact is, even if we just looked at the four tools um, to simplify it that I mentioned today that were used to address HIV AIDS, and we remodeled them to specifically be to um, specifically address sexual violence, I think that that in itself would have a, a drastic impact. Thank you for that question, Wadile. Uh, Yauna says, are there any resources you could recommend for further reading, specifically on how sexual violence is a function of power as opposed to sexual attraction? Yes. Um, as I said, I will... Um, give out the information of that landing page. It will also be in the link in my bio on my Instagram, but I will share it with Brennison. I'm not sure if you'll have a way to share it with everybody afterwards, um, but there's so many interesting studies um, on this that I just find so fascinating. Um, and it's very, very, very insightful, not just when it comes to rape and sexual violence, but also when it comes to the way that we view sexuality and how it ties into those things and a lot of very prejudice and false beliefs that we have regarding the connections between sex, sexuality and sexual violence. So I will definitely um, include some of those articles in the landing page. What action steps can we take to promote the services and funding for men's prevention and rehabilitation programs? Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think this really depends on where you are. 
I know that here in Minnesota, there are lots of different um, rehabilitation programs, although some of them may not refer to themselves in that way. People use different language, um, but I know that uh, women's advocates has something along those lines. I know that Tubman has something along those lines. Global Rights for Women, Minkasa. Um, you can also view a lot of these sessions, which um, has been one of the main ways that I have learned. You can actually, on the websites of some of these organizations, sign up to view some of these sessions um, with your camera off and your microphone muted and sit in on some how, how some of these rehabilitation sessions work. Um, a lot of these incredible organizations that do this work have donation links and all of this money goes towards not just the rehabilitation of perpetrators but running these organizations and all the different services and tools that they offer so I think that the main steps would be to just maybe sit in on some of those lessons, do research on the different ways and forms that they choose to carry them out. Different organizations will do it in very different ways. So obviously different countries will address it in very different ways as well, which is important because cultural context is very important. Um, and yeah, just viewing, watching, reading up on it and, and donating, I think are all great action steps. Um, how can we speak to children about sexuality in a way that might change the statistics on sexual violence and change the way girls perceive their own sexuality? Thank you. I love that question. Um, it's been scientifically proven that you can begin teaching children about consent and body ownership from as early as one years old. Um, I think one year old. Um, I think that there's a lot of difficulty in certain cultures or belief systems where people think that speaking to children about these issues too young sexualizes them or opens them up to issues and topics that are not age appropriate. And it's just not true because when speaking to children about consent and body ownership, the topic or the specific issue of sex never has to come up at all. There's so many fun and age appropriate ways that you can speak to children about this. Um, I myself have been doing presentations at schools. There's um, a game, for example, where you can tickle a child and stop the moment that they tell you to stop and exchange, um, change turns. <laughs> I don't know why my English has suddenly <laughs> abandoned me, but you can take turns playing this game and teach the child that it's important for them to stop the moment that you say stop. And so this is a fun way because it's it's tickling, it's lighthearted, but it teaches them that even with something that is fun and that is enjoyable, if the person you are doing it to or with no longer wants you to do it, you should stop. Um, so that's just one example, but there's, there's so many different ways to do this and so many um, different ways that we can address the issue of of consent and, and sexuality. Um, I myself have a book coming out called Ask Me First, and it is for children aged two to six years old. If you decide to follow me on Instagram or email me for more details, um, I would love to share that with you when I publish it in one month um, and let you know about it. But that's a great question and there's so many ways. I think that we should consider putting it in the academic curriculum and finding fun and safe and age appropriate ways to talk about these issues with our children. Do you do any work with missing and murdered indigenous women? Um, Thank you for the question, Christopher. I haven't had an opportunity to do any work um, in that field. However, I have attended presentations on um, that issue led by Indigenous women. It's something that has really saddened me and inspired me. It's an issue that I care about, but I myself don't work in it. I do try, however, to amplify um, those voices when and where I can.
Um, what organizations and individuals are you currently interested in and inspired by in Botswana doing this work? Um, there are so many great organizations in Botswana. Um, some of them may not directly be doing work that is uh, very directly about sexual violence. However, they're challenging cultural norms and doing things that I believe will ultimately contribute to ending sexual violence. So, for example, Lega Bibo is um, a wonderful organization, of course, fighting for the rights of LGBTQ people. Um, there is uh, End Girl Hate, which is a wonderful movement um, that empowers women and girls in Botswana. There are much smaller organizations as well. Uh, Tulufela Trust worked with people infected and affected with HIV AIDS. And um, many of those people were um, or are survivors of domestic abuse and sexual violence. Um, I could go on and on and on, um, but if you are interested, I would also be happy to write a list of shelters, organizations, and NGOs that I personally um, support and admire in Botswana um, for you to have as a reference. And I think... I think that's it for questions. I think that's all of them. Thank you so much, Denise. I'll include your contact information, including your Instagram and your Gmail account in the follow-up email. So there's one, one question that, that snuck in there. If you want to answer it, it's totally up to you. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, let me see. I've been reading on the rise of numbers of incels. Apparently, the traffic to the websites increased dramatically in recent years. Do you see this being discussed and how is it addressed? Um, I am actually not sure. Um, I know, so for, for context, uh, I believe that incel is a, people who define themselves as unable to get a sexual partner despite wanting one. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I, I didn't know that there's been a dramatic increase in this issue. I know I definitely do not see it being discussed and I don't know how it's being addressed, um, but I think that if it is an issue, it's not an issue that should have anything to do with sexual violence because being unable to get a partner despite desiring one is obviously not a justification of taking advantage of somebody. So I don't know enough about that topic to speak on it. And I'm afraid I can't give you an in-depth answer, but you've piqued my interest certainly and I'll look into it. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you again to our interpreters and to Nasser. I'll go ahead and stop the recording here.